Today we want to talk about the Silk Road. The Silk Road is not actually a road, it's a network of trading routes that linked uh, the Far East, that is China primarily, with areas from China all the way to the Mediterranean, to the Roman Empire. And it began somewhere around 200 BC, and it's the earliest uh, real exposure that China had to the West, and I'll talk about how all that happened in a few minutes. But the, um, this was a, a major event in terms of human history, the development of these trade routes. In fact, one, it has been said that the Silk Road routes were one of the most significant accomplishments in the history of world civilization. It quite literally was two millennia ago, it was an example of globalization, where the East and the West first came in contact with one another. And China was connected with the Roman Empire. The, it was the transmission not only of goods, which is what we think about, obviously it was named the Silk Road because silk was one of the commodities that China had that the, uh, the West really wanted once they became exposed to it. And, uh, but there was more than that. There were spices, there was silver, jade, um, and it involved not just China, but India, other parts of Central Asia as well, and then the products like glassware and things of that sort that they had developed in the Roman Empire and in the West. Um, this became an area, it affected all of the countries that you can see on this map. Again, the Chang'an was the capital in those days of the Han Empire, which is when all of this developed. And this was the, the primary routes between 300 BC and 100 AD. You can date it at different times. The, the most active period of time was about the 450 year period from 200 BC to 250 AD. But as I noted down here, it really continued up until the 15th century. Uh, it was still actively being pursued. And there's a lot of talk today about the rebirth of the Silk Road. Uh, China is investing an enormous amount of money in, in roads for transportation and the idea of being able to have more and more linkage along some of these same routes. But as you can see, it started in China, but, um, and I'll talk about some of these areas, the Taklamakan Desert, the, the Tarim Basin, and it affected, um, eventually affected India, Persia, all of the nations in between the Mediterranean Sea and China. And then from the uh, eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea, goods were transported all the way to Spain and to Britain because those were areas that were controlled by the Roman Empire. And so you can see this connection, uh, trade connection. And it wasn't, as I said, just commodities. There was also the transmission of language, of intellectual ideas, of religion. Buddhism and Islam both came to the Far East, primarily along the routes of the Silk Road. And many of the traders carried their religious beliefs with them. Um, a lot of technology, gunpowder, paper, movable print, a lot of different kinds of technologies were included in the kinds of things that were transmitted along this road. So I want to talk a little bit today about how it came to be, uh, some of the empires that were involved in it, and what a difference it made. To, in order to understand the beginning of the Silk Road, in fact, to understand a lot about Asian history, you, um, and you can apply this in one way or another to other parts of the world as well, you need to understand something about the geography of the area. This, of course, is China, India down here. But, um, and then Mongolia is up here. This is the Tarim Basin, the Taklamakan Desert that I keep mentioning. But up here, uh, this is the uh, plat Mongolian Plateau. There is roughly a line that runs along here that separates two very different geological areas and two very different cultural areas. To the north of that approximate line were the nomadic uh, herding Mongols and other, other groups of people. They primarily were um, nomadic in that they would travel based upon the seasons, wherever the grass was better. They primarily lived on animal products. They, uh, hor the horse was the most critical animal that they used, and they actually um, would drink uh, mare's milk, even fermented mare's milk was a very popular drink that sustained them. And um, from time to time, they would even eat horse meat but they preferred to ride the horses rather than eat them. So they also raised cattle and goats and other kinds, but almost all of their culture was based around the animals. The need to move from one area to another based upon the seasons and the availability of pasture land. They did very little settled agriculture. There was some, but not a lot. 
primarily because uh, most of the areas in the north are not fertile for uh, vegetable crops and things of that sort. They grew great grass, but they did not grow other crops very well. And because their lifestyle was involved in moving, you can't very well grow crops if you're moving from place to place, depending upon the time of year. But south of that approximate line, down in China, um, it was a very different situation. In China, they tended to be settled agrarian people. They grew crops. They did not, they were not nomadic. They didn't wander with the seasons or based upon when, you know, when particular uh, grasses were available. In fact, one of the things that happened is that in the south, in China, um, their horses were not strong enough to ride because apparently the grasses in China did not have enough uh, potassium, particularly, and other minerals for their horses to grow strong bones. In fact, the only way they could really use the Chinese bred horses were to have two of them or three of them even pulling a chariot for use in war, but they couldn't really ride them. They, uh, because they were settled though, they had rice and other crops, they grew millet, various other kinds of grain crops, as well as vegetables and that sort of thing. They developed great ceramic industries and metallurgy. You can't really have metallurgy. You can't, you know, you can't move to a new place and for a couple of months and set up an effective um, system for trying to create alloys of metal. And so the, in the north, they did not have all of those vegetable products. They didn't have a lot of the ceramics. They would do some hand-built things, but not an extensive array. They didn't have metal products. And yet they had very strong horses because the grass in the north and the, the area of the, the northern uh, nomads was very good for, for horses. And they would grow, their horses weren't very big, but they were very strong and they were uh, capable of uh, almost unbelievable um, acts of strength. And they could run all day long. It's some of the most powerful horses uh, ever. Today, um, a purebred Mongolian horse costs a fortune. Uh, because of they, they are such a unique breed. In fact, there was one area around the, um, which was in here, the Fergana Valley, that the horses were much larger and very powerful, and when the Chinese found out about them, they referred to them as, as the heavenly horses. More specifically, the heavenly horses that sweat blood, because either because of a, uh, you know, they would, when they exerted themselves, they would break capillaries and they would have, you know, some blood on their skin, or they think it may have been because of a parasite. But anyway, these horses were so large and so powerful and so different than the Chinese horses that when the Chinese found out about them, they called them the heavenly horses and they thought they were horses interbred with dragons. And on two different occasions, the Chinese sent armies to that area, which was to the west of the uh, Taklamakan Desert, Turin Basin, to try to bring these horses back. They were never successful. They traded for a few but they were never able to do very much with them. But this difference in terms of the lifestyle, the culture, the availability of resources between animal products in the north and then the uh, vegetable products and uh, the benefits of a stationary agrarian lifestyle in the south created both an interesting dynamic and also conflict between those two areas. This chart will give you a real now, I'm not going to talk about all these. <laughs> okay, so just, just relax. Um, you will notice up here in the Mediterranean, we have the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Macedonians, etc. Um, uh, the Roman Empire, this just gives you sort of a point of reference. The ones I do want to talk about, and this is Persia, the Red Woods are Persia, the Seleucids, Parth uh, Parthians, uh, Sasanians, and the Islamic dynasties later. Northern India, Mauryans, Guptas, Mughals, and then I am going to talk about the Kushans a little bit. Uh, and also particularly about the Xiongnu and the Han Dynasty. You'll notice that they occurred at the same time. Um, the, and we'll, oh, when we get over here, we end up with the Mongols and the Ming people we've talked about quite a bit already. But I'm especially gonna focus on this and then on the Kushans and because they were a later development from a group called the Weizi that I wanna talk about. Um, much of the dynamic that led to the Silk Road was caused by the contrast and conflict between Han China, which was very settled, very agrarian, very sophisticated. It was the golden age. It lasted for about 400 years, interestingly, right about the same 400 years that was uh, the development of the 
the Silk Roads because the Han really pioneered it, and the mounted nomads of the north, particularly a group called the Zhongnu. Um, the, we have records of Han China buying tens of thousands of head of cattle at one time from the Zhongnu and another group called the Weizi, two nomadic tribes that were to the north of them that were had their roots in the Mongol peoples. But um, the thing that the Chinese wanted most from the northern tribes were horses. Not only because horses were the key to military activities back then, because armed warriors was the way, was the ideal, and the Mongols were so powerful as mounted warriors, the Chinese were always trying to replicate that. And as I say, their horses were not strong enough to ride. The best they could do were chariots, and chariots went out of fashion as a military weapon fairly early on in the process. Uh, and I mentioned that the very best horses were those from the uh, Fergana Valley to the west of the Pamir Mountains, but always this conflict between the very settled um, agrarian Han and the, the very effective and very powerful nomadic warriors from the far north. This map gives you sort of the major players. Um, down here we have Han Dynasty China. Um, of course, over here you've got Japan and Korea, just to give you sort of locations. Um, the Han China, down here, the Zhongnu was a tribe in the north, and I'll talk about quite a bit, and the Weizi. To give you some idea, the Weizi at their heyday had somewhere, it varied over years, between 100,000 and 200,000 armed uh, horse warriors. They were for many, many years the most powerful of all the northern tribes. And there was some conflict between them and China, but for the most part they got along pretty well, they traded extensively, so that the things that, that China grew, the food that they grew and the other products they had, they would trade for horses and for cattle and other animal products that the Weizi had. For a long time, the Weizi and this group, the Zhongnu, were um, hated enemies. They fought, but the Weizi for many, many years had the upper hand because they were a united people, and the Zhongnu were all of these separate sort of tribes that were not, uh, not working together. And it was that way for many years until the second century, uh, shortly before 176 BC, a guy came along who was part of the Zhongnu, his name was uh, Cheng Yu Modu, and he, um, Modu is actually means chief, he was their head, it's like Khan for the, Chinese, for the Mongols later on. He united all of those tribes of the Zhongnu, and when you put them all together, they outnumbered and were more powerful than their enemies, the Weizi. And so they defeated the Weizi. The Xiongnu came from the north. They are here, the Xiongnu Empire, came from the north. They came south. They defeated both the Wusun, which was a lesser uh, group, and the Weizi, and they drove both of these to the west. They forced them off their land and forced them to go to the west. Well, once that was done, the Xiongnu became the primary opponents against the Han Dynasty opponents in terms of raiding, uh, always the conflict occurring at that time. The Zhongnu and the Weizi were, became such bitter enemies that the son of Cheng Yu Modu um, later on killed the king of the Weizi and turned his skull into a drinking cup, which was apparently the sort of thing you did back then. Um, and so the skull of the Weizi king became the drinking cup for the king of the Zhongnu. Um, and they, after they had defeated the Weizi and the Wusun and driven them off to the west, Zhongnu became the challenger for Han China. And at one point, because of the conflict, Han had to formally acknowledge that the Zhongnu were their equals, their partners, which is not set well with the, the Han, because they considered themselves, you know, it was called uh, the Middle Kingdom. They were the center of the world. The, uh, the, Emperor of China of the Han Dynasty considered himself a king under all heaven and here this this nomadic What they considered barbarian people who were simply more powerful with their mounted warriors forced them to acknowledge inequality with them Much of the great wall that was built by the Han and their development was exactly to keep out the Zhongnu to try to keep them to the north Again, the, the wall had existed to some extent before that, but the Han really extended it much further in order to try to protect their domain. Now, 176 was the, was the time in which the Zhongnu were 
combined by the one leader. In 146, the Xiongnu tried to attack uh, against the, the Great Wall, and they were defeated. They didn't make it. But just a few years later, this is in, actually in 176, right after they were united under Cheng Yu Modu, they were successful in breaching the wall and coming down south and raiding into China. It was right after this that the Chinese had to acknowledge that their military might uh, of the Xiongnu forced them to acknowledge them as partners. Now, you may never have heard of the Xiongnu, but you've probably heard of the Huns, right? Tell of the Hun. While it is not proven, and not all historians accept it, there is a theory that came out quite a few years ago that the Xiongnu, in their language, Xiongnu is the, the transliterated Chinese name for them. In their own language, it sounds more like Hunnu. In, and it's believed that from Mongolia, the Xiongnu may have actually traveled south and uh, west and eventually moved into Western Europe, into Hungary, and from there into other parts of uh, Western Europe, and that the Xiongnu may have become the Huns. And so that, because otherwise we have no record of where they went after, all, after being such a powerful people. Now, in fact, when they did move further to the, uh, like in the uh, 3rd century, 4th century and later, the Huns were one of the tribes that were very important in creating what's called the Great Migration. Um, the Roman Empire, the, that is the Western Roman Empire, which was centered in Rome, as opposed to the Eastern Roman Empire, which lasted much longer, which was centered in Constantinople. Uh, but the Western Roman Empire in Rome was actually uh, defeated in the 5th century, in the 400s, and uh, primarily by barbarian tribes. And barbarian is not, it's not a pejorative necessarily, it, it's, it means they, they barbled, they didn't speak uh, Latin or Greek. And so it re refers to the fact that they spoke languages that nobody understood. Well, the Hun were one of the major groups of people that did that, along with a lot of other different tribes, and that's called the Great Migration. When all of these groups from Central Europe and uh, or Central Asia and East Asia moved to the West and ended up taking over much of Western Europe, including causing the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Well, the Huns may very well have been the Xiongnu, and they may, may have been one of the ones that were primarily responsible for that, that mid fifth century fall of the Western Roman Empire. So that's what we think happened to the Xiongnu after all this. But what happened to the Huizi? The, uh, the other major tribe that had been the enemies of the Xiongnu and had been forced to move to the west in 176, that's when the Xiongnu were united, they moved west and then south. Um, they defeated a number of other major groups at that point. For instance, the Sakai, who are also known as the Scythians, if you've ever heard of the Scythians, renowned warriors, the Weizi defeated them and moved further south. And at a certain point, as they came down into Bactria and down into India, and they controlled this part of uh, sort of Central uh, and Central South Asia, the largest tribe that was part of the larger Wazi, were, uh, the, the family name of that clan was the Kushans. And they became known as the Kushan Empire. And they controlled an enormous area. If you have not heard of the Kushan, that's a shame. They need to get more credit because they were primarily responsible, for instance, for the transmission of Buddhism into, um, from India into East Asia. They were a primary middleman for all of this trade that was going from China. You know, they, the, the camel caravans, which is how the trade happened for a long, long time, at the height of the Silk Road uh, routes, they would have caravans of as many as 10,000 camels. And this is how much movement there was. Later on, they actually added sea routes to that because there were some products like ceramics that did not travel very well on the back of a camel. And yet there was a market for it, and so they began to use ships as well. But they did not start in China and you know take their camels loaded down with goods all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. They would take it to a certain distance and sell it, and then those people would take it so far and sell it. And so there were always middlemen. That was their distribution network. Well, the Kushans, who had formerly been known as the Weizi, um, and were up here with the Xiongnu and Han China, they became some of the primary middlemen, if you will, 
in the whole transfer of product and of ideas and of religion and of technology between the East and the West because they ended up settling and creating a major empire. The Kushan was a very significant empire uh, in the Central and Central South Asian uh, area. And again, they're credited with being the ones that really transferred Buddhism from India, because that's where they, you know, much of uh, it ended up there, over to places further east as part of the trading cycle. So here, Han China, I'm going to back up a little bit historically, Han China is confronted with the Zhongnu, and the Zhongnu are very successful in fighting them. The Han have to acknowledge them as equals, which they are not happy with. And the emperor of China, of Han China, remembered that there used to be this group, the Weizi, they got driven west, and that they had been, for a long time, successful in fighting the Zhongnu. So the emperor of China decided, what we need to do is go west and find those guys, the, the Weizi, bring them back, offer to, to join with them in fighting our common enemy, the Zhongnu, and if we fight together and defeat them, then everybody will be happy. And we'll let the Wei Zi have the Zhang News property and then they'll leave us alone. So the emperor of China um, commissioned an envoy at this time in, in 138 BC, uh, the dates are down here, it's um, 138 to uh, 125, but the screen doesn't go quite far enough south. Um, so they commissioned a man named Jiang Chan Zhang Chan today is one of the uh, most popular historical heroes in China. You will find statues to Zhang Chan all over China because he, um, commissioned by the emperor in Chang'an, that was their capital, he traveled to the west. He actually got captured by the Zhongnu and taken to their capital, Longcheng, up here in Zhongnu territory, where he lived for 10 years. He got married there, he had kids there, and then after 10 years he said, maybe I should go back and see what's happening in China. No, he actually ended up escaping because they stopped paying much attention to him. He traveled further to the west and got all the way over here to the Pamir Mountains, uh, Sogdiana uh, and Bactria, and over here he started hearing about, for one thing, the places he experienced no Chinese had ever seen those places or those people groups. No one had ever brought that information about those places back. And while he was traveling, he also heard about this very uh, great empire further to the west, which was the Roman Empire. When he came back after 10 years, and he made a second shorter version later, he made, finally made it back to Chang'an, he was the first one to deliver accurate information about what was to the west of China. No one had, that connection had never been made. And because of that, the Chinese emperor then commissioned others as emissaries to go and begin to develop trade relations with those various kingdoms and peoples uh, as far west as they could go. And over a period of time, they developed those connections, which became the Silk Road Network, all the way as far as the Mediterranean Sea. And so this man, Sheng, um, Sheng Kit Chan, is considered the person who is really responsible for opening up China to the West and creating the Silk Road in terms of making it possible. And as I say, he's now a national hero in China. His exploits were communicated in one of the most important history books in China in the first century um, AD, the historian uh, Sima Chan wrote a book called The Records of the Great Historian, and he recorded all that had happened with um, with Chiang Chan, and so he's a a major player, and yet again, most of us had never heard of him. This is where the the Han Dynasty, when they realized the potential, they developed the series of trade routes based upon the information that Chiang Chan brought back, and this is called the Hexi Corridor. There are six sort of trading posts along this area. It's the Hexi Corridor or the Ganzu Corridor, it's also called. And it would come up, this is the Taklamakan Desert, also the, it's called the Tarim Basin because it's a low area. And they determined that there were routes, you had to either go south of the Taklamakan Desert or north of the Taklamakan Desert, or you could take a northern route before you got there. Uh, 
In order to protect this as far as they could, the Han Dynasty actually extended the Great Wall right along here. Uh, Dunhuang here is right here. These villages are all built right along the, the south side of the Great Wall, or it's more appropriately said, they built the Great Wall just on the <coughs> north side of those villages so that they could protect this early part of the trading route from various, any attacks that might come from the north. And so um, that was one of the major reasons why they were aggressive in extending the Great Wall. Um, and these routes continue to be made. Now, this is why there were only so many places that you could cross. Um, this is why they didn't just sort of strike out across the desert. This is what much of this territory in the western part of China looks like. Um, you can imagine. You don't just sort of say, oh, well, let's go up there. Um, there were only certain passes, certain ways you could get through, and even after you got past the uh, Taklamakan Desert, there were mountains. There are lots of very high mountains in there. In fact, the highest roadway system in the world is a Chinese roadway system in those mountains. The Pamir Mountains, and you get just south of that are the Hindu Kush, which, are, you know, which connects to Afghanistan, go down into Afghanistan. South of that, there, of course, are the Himalayas. All of these mountain areas are kind of surrounding all of this. So there were very limited ways that you could get through there, and that's why they had to really pioneer these routes. But again, there was no one road. They did have several different ways that they could follow it. Um, this is the kind of system that they ended up with um, after all was said and done. This from Chang'an, the capital, and they, they actually extended some of the routes further over to Yoyang. They went up here around the Taklamakan des the Desert, or the Chiron Basin, it's called. They had routes around that, and there were trading stations all the way along here and also a northern route that went up to the Black Sea. That's going to be important. I'll talk about that in a second. And then they extended those routes down into India. This is where the Kushan Empire was, and so they were very involved in that. All the way over, they were trading for spices and, uh, and incense and things of that sort in Arabia. All of this became a connected network. And of course, Alexandria, Tyre, Antioch, Byzantium, all of these were major ports on the Mediterranean from which they could provide these various goods and technology and, and uh, communications to the Roman Empire and other areas further to the west. And so this is why this became so important. The name of this, um, the Silk Roads, actually didn't get coined until the 19th century, the 1800s. There was a, a an expert on Chinese geography and sociology whose name was uh, Ferdinand von Richthofen. You recognize that name? The First World War, the, the top uh, German ace flyer was the Baron von Richthofen. This was his uncle who gave Silk Road the name for this whole network. Um, and again, merchandise, culture, languages, philosophy, ideas, religion, technology, various inventions, artwork, all of it was moving back and forth by this time. The Silk Roads constituted about 12,000 kilometers of routes, both by land and sea, because again, later on, there were some products that either were too heavy, like when they started uh, transferring metal ores, which there was a demand for because they're not available everywhere, or ceramics, which were more fragile. Those kinds of things were much better to transfer by sea than they were by camel, and so they developed routes from Guangzhou um, down through past Hanoi, around this way, and so they had sea routes as well. So India was very much involved in that, um, as well as the other areas in, in the Middle East. Amongst the things that got transferred as well, um, and there are some, I've got some images down here of some of the things, you know, metal, ceramics, silk, um, sculptures of various kinds that, that were transferred back and forth. So Islam traveled to the, to the east via these routes. Buddhism traveled from India to the east via these routes. And once it got to China, of course, it then got to Korea and then got to Japan. So there's, all of this affected really the entire world. And interestingly, um, also disease was carried. The Black Death, for instance, when you get into the 14th century, the 1300s, um, there was the transmission because you had trade and ships. Then um, the Black Death, 
which is, they believe now is a combination of diseases. It was not only bubonic plague, well there's three kinds of plague, uh, bubonic, pneumonic, and septicemic. All of them are part of the Black Death. They also believe anthrax may have been wrapped in there and several other things, which is altogether was what made it so, so lethal, um, you know, that it killed a third of the population of Western Europe. Well, one of the things that happened, this is the Black Sea, and I'm going to talk about the Mongols in just a minute. By the Mongols there, I mean Genghis Khan and his descendants that created the largest contiguous empire in world history. They did it in just two generations. Um, the, uh, one of the things that they did when they were, they were assaulting the city of Kaffa on the northern part of the Black Sea in 1347, if I remember correctly, um, the, they were, there was a fortress there and they couldn't get into the fortress and they're bombarding it. Well, the Black Death began in either China or Mongolia. We're not sure, but whichever one it started in, it quickly traveled to the other. And so when the Mongols are outside the fortress city of Kaffa, which was a port city, which meant that the boats could go in and out, but they couldn't get in from the land side. When the Mongols are attacking in 1347 Kaffa, they, um, they got struck by the plague. Um, so the Mongols are dying from the plague, and they decided, we're going to share the joy. So they started uh, catapulting bodies of plague victims into the city of Kaffa. And in the process, um, the, there were primarily Genoese ships, you know, from uh, Genoa that were on the port side. Well, at a certain point, um, you know, people started getting sick. So, of course, these Genoese sailors jump on their ship. They leave the Black Sea, come down to the Mediterranean Sea, and travel to Western Europe. This, in the middle of the 14th century, was the beginning of the worst of, I mean, there were many, many different times the plague uh, burst out in, in Western Europe. But from there, it, you know, it hit Italy, because that's where the primary place they stopped. It went to France. It went throughout all of Europe. And again, a third of the population of Europe died. Well, that had come along the Silk Road, thanks to the Mongol armies and their willingness to share it with uh, the people in Kaffa when they were cut off from there. These, uh, this shows you some of the modern nations that are, were affected by this. China, of course, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, southern part of Russia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, what was then Persia, now is Iran, Iraq, Turkey, the Caucasus area of Russia, um, Greece, all of these were part of this route. And if you, you, today you can actually travel the Silk Road routes. They have tours that will take you from cities like Merv, you know, major center points of the transfer of goods. They would have what's called uh, caravansaries, which were places where cav uh, camel caravans could stop and rest and trade their goods. They had room for the, for the animals as well as uh, it's sort of a, a rest stop, except you would be able to spend a day or two days or however long you needed to to rest up, to resupply, and to sell your goods. And they existed, and still some of the largest markets in the world, that is um, outdoor markets, uh, the, not, we're not talking supermarkets, but outdoor markets in the world are along some of these areas, Bishkes, uh, Bishkek, Tashkent, Samarkand, some of these you probably have heard of, Bukhara, all of those were major, and Merv, major cities along these routes. Um, and in addition to all of those different modern countries that were impacted by this, Various other, I mentioned the Han, the Xiongnu, the Weizi, and the Wusun, but others that you may be familiar with were affected by this greatly in terms of the trade. The Parthians, the Scythians, or Sakai, they're also called, the White Huns, the Hephthalites, Uyghurs, Sogdians, Gurkirks, uh, Gurk Turks, the Sassanids, the Timurids, and many, many others. You may not recognize some of those, but in their day, those were major people groups. Some of them could qualify legitimately as empires. And all of them were affected by this, um, as well as it being the basis for the impact on modern countries. Now, in the 13th and 14th centuries, in fact, starting right at the beginning of the 13th century, we have the rise of the Mongols. And by, when I say Mongols here, I don't mean those with a Mongol background like the Xiongnu, but rather the, we're talking here, Genghis Khan, and again, we used to call him Genghis Khan, but pronunciation of most of the words uh, has been changed because they changed the system for transliterating. Genghis Khan is actually, actually a much more accurate way to pronounce his name. 
It's actually a title. His original name was, uh, was Timogen, but Chinggis Khan means the universal ruler. Khan means ruler. Uh, Chinggis means over everybody. And so at the beginning of the 13th century, um, he was a young man who his father was kind of a minor lord amongst one of the clans in the, amongst the Mongol people. His father was killed. He became somewhat orphaned, he and his mother. He had to learn to defend himself and fend for himself very early on. Um, and we're talking now at the first, first few years of 1200, 1206 particularly, was a major, uh, a major point where he was orphaned and he went out on his own. But um, after that, he showed himself to be very smart, very capable as an organizer, a natural leader. People started following him. He got more and more of his clan and then other clans to join with him until eventually they declared him to be the Chinggis Khan, the ultimate ruler over all the Mongol people. And as a result of that, this is what we ended up with, the largest contiguous empire ever in history. This is uh, 1245, so this is just 39 years after he sort of got started as a boy. Um, in addition to Chinggis Khan, who is represented here as a painting, uh, he had four sons and then two significant grandsons. Um, his sons were, from left to right, Yoki, Chagatai, Ogadai, Tolui, and his grandsons uh, on the right-hand side um, are Halegu and Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan is probably the one best known other than Chagas Khan. When he died, he left all of his empire to his sons and grandsons. And again, the only empire ever in history bigger than this one was the British Empire, which was not contiguous, meaning it was an all-in-one. It was spread out all over. You know, it was Australia, Canada, um, uh, India, etc. But this is the largest contiguous, and it happened in two generations, as opposed to hundreds and hundreds of years that it took for the accumulation of all the properties that the British Empire constituted. So um, it reached quite literally from the Sea of Japan all the way over into Eastern Europe. And had it not been for uh, some, from their perspective, untimely deaths, uh, whenever the one of the one of the sons, or later one of the grandsons, would be named the Great Khan, the one that was the others were supposed to acknowledge as being the real one in charge. Whenever the great Khan would die, the various um, aggressions, the various military um, campaigns that were being carried on ended because they all had to go back to meet a, as a gathering, not only the, um, the sons and grandsons, but any of the other sort of royal clan leaders had to get together to select a new great Khan. And so the only reason, particularly in Eastern Europe, why they stopped there is because Hulegu Khan died uh, when they were uh, at this point, and they all had to come back all the way to Mongolia in order to make that decision. They had to be present for that. Um, there are four significant legacies that uh, Chinggis Khan left. I could say five. One of them was massive destruction. I mean, there's no question about that. You, cannot, you can't deny the fact that Chinggis Khan and his family uh, generally speaking, as they rampaged across um, Eurasia, if they approached a city and invited that city to surrender and to come under their control, if the city agreed, then that was fine, you know, and they would, they would accept that and they would leave somebody there to be in charge, but they would pretty much leave everything intact. If the city did not give in, they would destroy it they, and they would kill pretty much everybody in the city. Um, in areas that were not willing to submit, they not only broke into the cities, killed a whole lot of people. In fact, probably more people were killed by the, by the Mongol campaigns than any other in history. Um, they, would, they would then destroy the infrastructure. Um, they were not, for the most part, until Kublai Khan came along in China, the Khans were not especially interested in governing, they were interested in conquering. But they didn't leave governments in place. And because they weren't really that, that concerned about ruling, um, you have things like the, the Iranian plateau at one point was, uh, well, they, they, it's estimated they probably killed 80% of the people in the Iranian plateau. Mesopotamia, um, the area of the Middle East the, between the Tigris and Euphrates River, was entirely irrigated. And when the Mongols came through, they destroyed the irrigation system, and it has never fully recovered. Much of that area still is not able to grow crops because the irrigation system's gone from the, from the 13th century when these guys came through. But at the same time, 
Chinggis Khan was uh, quite enlightened in many ways. For instance, he reorganized the army and he set it up so that anyone who proved themselves to be competent and loyal would receive reward and promotion. Doesn't have to be a relative of his, and it did not have to be from a high clan. Some clans were considered lower clans, and prior to Chinggis Khan, if you weren't part of the high clans, then you were not going anywhere in the world. He changed that. He was more concerned about people being competent. He also divided the property um, uh, that was taken among, and that means the, the various sort of uh, material goods that they, they captured, would divide it amongst the troops, and he actually kept very little for himself. Um, he continued to travel up until his death, and so he didn't want to carry a lot of stuff around. He lived well for somebody who's living out of a tent, but still, he would divide that up amongst the people who won the battles. And so he was very popular as a leader. In addition to that, he advocated complete religious tolerance. He did not force people to worship the, the pantheon of gods that the Mongols uh, worshipped. He insisted, they had not had a, a writing system before Chinggis Khan, he insisted on creating, having created, he couldn't write, having created a Mongol writing system so that they began to have a literature. He also supported trade and crafts. They would do a lot to bring